speaker and final speaker for the conference. Mark flew in last night. Thank you, Mark. Uh, image as living nature, Jung's notion of the soul and Nietzsche's pluralistic vision of consciousness. Thank you. Um, a great pleasure to be here. I'm sorry I couldn't make the rest of the conference, which I really much, very much wanted to do. Uh, but already I feel like I'm in, uh, you know, the story of the ugly duckling. You know, eventually you find a flock that you can fly with. Um, I've had that experience several times. And the reality here is I've just had to show up uh, to become a Jungian. I had to do like nine and a half years of training. Um, so this is a lot easier. Um, um, but a great group to be with, and I can see that I've missed a lot. Um, what I have to offer uh, may be of, of somewhat more humble origins. Um, what, I'm, what I'm bringing is uh, some drawings by a young girl that I worked with. And my connection to this material is not through academia. It's through just the uh, nuts and bolts problem of encountering a patient in therapy and having to try to understand what the heck's going on. And as I dug and dug and dug and dug, I found Jung. And eventually, as I was writing my thesis, and Jeff was on my thesis committee, I began to talk about different structures of consciousness. Um, I had gotten more involved in um, uh, Alan Combs, a little bit of his work, and then into Gebser, and then started reading Gebser. And Jeff kindly let me know this was happening, and I had to be here. So here I am. Um, just to uh, give you an idea of my background, the, the MFA, I come from an arts background. I was a painter for many years. Uh, I really left the fine arts field directly as a, as a career. I was actually successful at it. Um, but I'd always been interested or aware that, uh, as Jung said, image is psyche, and that psychological phenomena images. And in that sense, I don't mean image, of course, just as a, a picture, although I'm going to be showing some pictures so we can talk about a common experience together. Um, but that image could be almost anything. And in fact, we were just talking with Doc, was talking about little Christmas trees. And he says, even there? And I said, yes, even there. You know, whatever it is, is alive and uh, speaking to us. And um, as I begin to dig more and more, one of the things that I'm very critical of, I'm critical of contemporary psychology, because I think uh, contemporary psychology is complicit in the process of cutting us off from our own living nature. Um, this quote is by René Guénon. Uh, it's one of the first things he says in Symbols of Sacred Science. Modern civilization appears in history as a veritable anomaly. Of all known civilizations, it's the only one to have developed in a purely material direction and the only one not based on any principle of a higher order. This material development already underway for several centuries now and continuing at an ever accelerating pace has been accompanied by an intellectual regression for which is unable to compensate. I think you heard uh, um, Jerome talk about an addiction. And this is the process of addiction. And as we know, addiction eventually leads to a place where it, it just cannot redeem itself. It hits a bottom. And it sounds like, in many ways, we are going to be hitting that bottom. Um, contemporary psychology, um, in following that, uh, colludes, I think, with uh, the same process that Brian Goodwin's talking about. Brian Goodwin, if you don't know him, great author. He died recently. <laughs> Biologist, uh, wrote a book called Nature's Due, and really talking about some of the limitations of our scientific involvement with nature and stressing that we need to be involved in nature on many, many levels. The process of continuous growth that our politicians and economists offer as a path to happiness and fulfillment is, in fact, a policy of conflict resolution that continually transfers our debt to nature, whose bounty we are living from and systematically destroying. So, uh, this process of this one-sided uh, way of approaching thing and this idea, uh, what, uh, what Jerome has called dominion, this idea that we can possess nature through a particular kind of knowledge and have control over nature is a highly mistaken idea and actually very, very problematic, as I think almost all of you in this room would agree. My specific concern is how that's happening to the individual patients that I'm working with, and I see that continually. 
Some of you may know of Jurgen Moltmann. I bet you do. Um, uh, and Moltmann, in the, at the very end of uh, The Crucified God, makes this wonderful comment. Any therapy is directed towards health, but health is a norm which changes with history and is conditioned by society. If in today's society health means the capability to work and the capability for enjoyment, as Freud could put it, and this concept of health even dominates psychotherapy, the Christian interpretation of the human situation must nevertheless also question the compulsive idolatry which the concepts of production and consumption introduce into this definition and develop another form of humanity. Suffering in a superficial, activist, apathetic, and therefore dehumanized society can be a sign of spiritual health. So my patient comes in, and am I supposed to look at them and say they have something wrong with them? Or is there, in fact, something right with them? Uh, Thomas Nagel, in a little book called Mind and Cosmos, uh, Thomas Nagel, uh, you're probably, probably familiar with him, is something of a phenomenologist, uh, fairly popular, written a lot of books, um, is really articulating and consolidating the image of this hegemonic attitude of a particular structure of consciousness and its hold over all of the diversities of consciousness and exclusion of those. The story goes like this. There is no need for an expanded form of understanding. Instead, the history of human knowledge gives us reason to believe that there is ultimately one way that the natural order is intelligible, namely through physical law. This actually is really epidemic in contemporary psychology. And in fact, the notion that if you make an assertion in psychological circles, the answer is always, well, where's your evidence for that? Really putting it on a rationalistic perspectival plane as we might understand it. The problem with that, of course, is that um, this thing scrambled the image. Um, here we have uh, technology intervening again. But um, uh, humanity is really not obviously uh, composed of simply a material existence. Uh, humanity also has an internal existence, which is immaterial. And the methodology necessary to understand outer phenomena is very different than the, the, the methodology that we need to understand internal phenomena. Uh, we're not going to use a microscope to look at the stars, and we're not going to use a telescope to look at microbes. And yet this notion that because we can extend measurability to all phenomena, therefore all phenomena are susumable within that paradigm is just a logical fallacy. In fact, in order to get out of that, you have to depart from that paradigm. And of course, my interest in Gabeser uh, is evident. Uh, any attempt to describe the problematics of soul and spirit is fraught with risks, since we know that the soul eludes to a great extent a calculative, rational description, and that such an approach is incommensurate with the soul's immeasurable nature. So Gebser there is uh, uh, articulating that very problem that I think contemporary psychology faces, that we're trying to place phenomena that extend into all different facets of human capacity for engagement with nature onto a single plane of understanding. And as such, it distorts things. Now, what's really interesting about this is actually psychotherapy research actually says just that. This is a Bruce Wampold in The Great Psychotherapy Debate. And he says, decades of psychotherapy research have failed to find a scintilla of evidence that any specific ingredient is necessary for therapeutic change. Now, at first glance, that seems like a rather benign comment until you recognize that what's implied by that is psychological phenomena are not operating along efficient and material causal uh, pathways. So in other words, uh, factuality is not necessary for psychotherapeutic change. You can have uh, a therapy that has facts in it, but factuality is not causal of psychotherapeutic change. What is? There's a very clear answer to that. For the therapist, the theory becomes the map for psychotherapy. None of these maps is reality, but each represents phenomena in some useful way. Psychotherapy theory provides a map for the therapist, not a complete reflection of reality, 
but a useful representation. Simply, there is no therapy without theory. Theory is a myth. Theory is a fiction. So we need to actually enter into a very different paradigm other than the rational paradigm in order to have influence on the human psyche. Psychotherapy process proceeds through fictivity. We have to enter into the mythic structure or have a mythic structure that we're operating from. Some years ago, I had the uh, occasion to have a young girl brought to me, age 13. Uh, the young girl's situation was this. She was the oldest of three daughters, lived with their mother, who had moved from another state because the father was a raging alcoholic and had mental health issues and was abusive. Um, the drawing that I've uh, asked her to do was a simple bridge drawing. You know, as an art therapist, this is a very simple thing that sometimes you ask people to do to get the ball rolling, and she produced this image. On the left side of the picture here, you have an interesting image that is an amalgam of a barn and a house. And additionally, there's an X across the door, and there's a window up high. Barns don't typically have smokestacks. Right? They don't have chimneys like that. And on the other side, she had Disney World. And we notice that there's subjective color over here and objective color over here. And this is a very interesting thing as well. This bridge um, is over a vertical axis comprised of water. I want you to keep your eye on that. Because what I'm going to be trying to show you is that imaging creates its own intrinsic logic. And that, in fact, is nature speaking to us. It's an autonomous voice. Now, for myself, what, my, what caught my eye immediately was this. It's big, it's red, I was very interested in it, and I saw the door. Don't go in there, it's like a bluebeard, right? You can't go in that room. <laughs> so naturally, my curiosity was drawn. Now, I want to point something out about that. This nature coming from within the patient is actually inducing me to go into it. It's having an effect on me and drawing me into its mystery. And I said to her, well, what's in the barn? And without skipping a beat, she said, nothing, but there's a horse around back. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I should have known. <laughs> and so I said, well, can I see the horse? Now, looking at this inner and outer world, right? Uh, Yuasa Yasuo, who is a uh, Japanese philosopher who writes a lovely little book called Synchronicity and Image Thinking, uh, talks about the pre-established harmony between elements that are otherwise bifurcated and dissociated in consciousness. That is, in fact, they have an equilibrating relationship. And being part of one totality, which is what John was saying, it's all one, those things are manifestations at different levels of something that is part of a whole. The physical world over there, we can apply a rational paradigm in order to somewhat understand it. And we actually look at the inner world and the images of the inner world and recognize that the outer world has provided a palette from which it can speak and articulate its nature. But the reality isn't that they're so distinct in this way. They're a bit more like this. You know, they're constantly in dialogue with one another. The inner world is constantly being dramatized. It's being dramatized in the fact that I have to put up the Christmas tree and spend hours and hours and hours because I'm married to a wife for reasons that are internal. And somebody else just has a little tree that they stick in the corner and they're happy with that, right? That our inner worlds are dramatized in an outer way. And the outer world is always coming into us and internalizing in us and setting up structures and changing us. And this is uh, Yuasa again. He says, behind the world of perceived things, there is an invisible world of potential information and potential energy. In the surface world, we live in the realm of matter. But latent behind it is the world in which there is no distinction between matter and mind. Standing on the tangential point of these two worlds is the eye of each of us. That's what I was trying to show you with that weird diagram. But there we are in the middle. And as conscious beings, we're in the center 
of a lot of different influences and a lot of different polarities that are operating at all times. The collective unconscious can be comprehended in this way by expanding it to the cosmos. Now, this is very interesting. In many religions, they, they would say something like, rejoice for your name is written in heaven. That the discrete entity of the individual also has a direct link to the superordinate principle. That those things are always having some sort of uh, relationship. Uh, you're, you're already anticipated at the highest order even though you're this distinct little experiencing organism. This hidden order is what Jung, borrowing the terminology of alchemy, calls the unus mundus, one world. If we view this broadly, I think that this connects us to the view that the cosmos has life and mind. Elsewhere in, uh, in Nagel's book, he says, it's like the universe is waking up to itself through us. And that humanity is an organismic function of the universe. It's another way to think about it that we are functioning organs of what we're in. Well, I asked to see the horse, and this is what she showed me. That's an interesting horse. It's a very specific horse. It's a draft horse. And its function is to take things someplace. And the scene, you can see all the color up here, is it's a harvest scene. So now, my take is, there's something to be harvested here. Now, the rages that she was having, I didn't share this point with you, but I, I'm glad I'm coming back to it because it's very important. When she was brought to me, the social worker who had met with her mother said, your daughter's bipolar and she's going to be on medication for the rest of her life. And so you might want to put her into therapy. Okay. Now, what's significant about that is that the thinking was automatically to take her symptoms and see her symptoms as evidence of defect. That's a needing of correcting in a medical manner. And actually to define them according to a medical procedure. The, the idea of a medical model, the idea that this is physiologically something wrong with her. Never was there uh, any quarter given to the idea that her symptoms might actually be significant of something else, an expression of something. And I was intrigued by this. What was it in need of harvest? And why would this image of the horse um, that was hiding behind the barn that had caught my attention, you see what's going on there is I'm being drawn more deeply into the image world. I'm being invited in, constantly being uh, uh, directed in a particular direction. And there's a close-up. This is a comment by Evangelos Christou in a lovely little book called The Logos of the Soul. And he says, what is, thus what a psychologist comes to know about the soul qualifies him in a way that scientific knowledge can never qualify the scientist. For the scientist, it is always possible, indeed it is imperative, that he should divorce his personality from what he knows and from the matter to which this knowledge applies. The application of his method is independent of its effects on him and his investigations are carried on in spite of his personality. Not so the psychologist who at the same time as he studies his world is creating it as well as creating himself. So now in my participation with what's going on with this patient, which I'm going to assert is not only about her, but oddly anticipates who I am and responds to me. And that's a rather fascinating concept. That this thing that I would think is impersonal and just like a gumball would be drop out of, out of her psyche, is actually knows me. And this begins to deepen even further. But there's also this process that the image itself is resituating consciousness. It's saying, no, I don't want you sitting there. I want you over here. And that I have to enter into its world. It's not that I stand aside and I have my diagnostic manual and I check off the list and come up with the answer. It's that I actually enter into her world so that I'm a participant in that world. And then that world is actually feeling my presence in that process. So I said, well, where's the horse going? 
and she produces this picture. Ah, two horses. The old horse is departing the scene. The cart's parked. And this horse is a very different horse. This isn't the horse that's the animal out there that you're cracking the whip. This is the horse that you become a kind of integral part of, that you climb on, that you're riding with. And we can see that it's adorned. It's well cared for. And so my question was, well, who's that? And what she says to me is, oh, that's Phoebe. Phoebe? Yeah, Phoebe. Why Phoebe? Oh, that's what my mother calls me when I'm raging. Oh. Why, what about that name Phoebe? Oh, I like the name Phoebe. Now, it suddenly occurs to me that outwardly, the great demon, Phoebe, in the outer world, is a big pain in the ass, screaming its head off. But inwardly, take a look at the picture. What is it? In the inner world, it's quite different. It's bringing food, bringing sustenance to the house. It's delivering what is ripe. Now, if you stop and think about what's going on here, what has happened is just by listening to the image and following the image, it's led me to the personification of the problem. And what it, what it instilled in me, it rem reminded me of uh, a line from uh, Rilke, who uh, in writing, I think it's in, on love and other difficulties, says, sometimes terrible things are merely helpless things, much in need of help from us. And I said to her, I said, do you suppose it's possible that your anger is a part of you that's unhappy about something? And she allowed that that was the case. And we ended that day's session. Now, the next week, excuse me, ne the next week she uh, shows up and I said, would you like to continue with our theme of Phoebe? She says, no. <laughs> Well, what would you like to do? She goes, I don't know. And she pulls out a piece of paper, and she starts drawing, and she produces this. Do you remember the water in the first image? And it's on the vertical axis. Okay. So the reason I'm lifting that up is what I'm trying to point out is that what's before us participates in a logic of its own. And it's incumbent upon us to try to enter into that logic. Uh, Hillman says something lovely about this. He says, psyche distorts in order that we kind of resituate ourselves so that the distortion actually makes sense, right? So the image is kind of leading us in a way and altering how we're looking at something. Um, I was caught as well by this lovely um, comment by Rene Guénon. Now, I've seen this whole pattern many times before. Um, in which change in psychological language is not a linear change. It's a change of planes. Okay? It happens in quanta, not in linearity. Um, um, Wolfgang Giegrich says, psychological change isn't that you know more or you know better or you're smarter. It's not a quantum of information. It's a rearrangement of logical order. We see that the vertical axis is determined as the will of heaven. Some people brought up the I Ching. The I Ching is the will of heaven. This, the inquirer goes and says, what's the will of heaven? You were open up to hear that. In the being's development, and this fact at the same time determines both the direction of the horizontal planes representing different states and the horizontal and vertical correspondence of these states, thereby establishing their hierarchical arrangement. So something wants to move on a vertical axis. Now, knowing full well that this young girl's father was fairly abusive, not abusive directly to her, but fairly violent and abusive to the mother, I was consciously aware of um, my masculinity and actually, uh, until this moment, had realized that I had totally withheld that masculinity from entry into the room. Also, being a gratefully recovering Catholic, um, sexuality was something that I didn't want to enter into the picture, but here it was coming in, submerged sexuality, 
leaping up into our case. And I felt it. I felt the energy of that. That vertical axis is well known to us. Here it is in the Annunciation. It's on the horizontal plane, but the angel has descended from heaven. And here we have uh, the, the, new, the new thing coming from the structure, which is beyond the ken or beyond the understanding of the earthbound horizontal plane, descending and bringing something that is going to open up a whole new vista. And in that same way, the, the, the mermaid emerges into our sessions and brings a whole new energy. And suddenly I began to realize that what was raging in this person, in this young girl, was a piece of nature of herself that had not been met. Um, uh, taking uh, Gabser's work, um, the axis of image can come from any direction. It can come from magical, mythical, it can come from the archaic, uh, it can come from the temporal. And in all of these things, really come together and coalesce in the singular expression before us in the immediacy of our experience. In this girl's case, quite clearly, as a young American girl, she would be very familiar with the Disney tale. Right? Here's Ariel. But on another level, really what's going on is that motif is connecting her to timelessness. That image has been around since humans have been around since we have recorded understanding of human imagery. The tale itself, actually, behind this image is really quite interesting, but I won't go into that just yet. Um, but while we have the image holding on one hand something which, uh, for, uh, which for the patient would be rather benign, at the other level, it's connecting what is benign to what is actually timeless and hugely powerful a powerful, timeless force of femininity emerging in this young girl. And I felt that. <laughs> Here are the sirens. You know, we have Odysseus and the sirens, remember that? You know, he has to you know, clog up his sailors' ears so that they row past, you know, and they don't go on to the rocks while he gets a chance to listen. He has to divide his ego between what it does and what it experiences. And I could feel the energy of that. This was a rather profound moment in this young girl's experience. And the whole room felt very differently. Um, just to follow out the case a little bit, I'm not going to show you all the, photo, all, all the images. But um, what then happened was she began to bring other, another mermaid from the depth. She had a, a partner from the depth that came up. They began to play. They began to go on some different islands. And eventually, they went on to land. And then eventually, she, she drew spontaneously, once again, did a vertical picture of herself with a subtle bifurcation in herself um, that was reminiscent of the old divide, but really brought the two things together. The um, raging symptoms dissipated. She had been placed on medication, tapered her off the medication, and she's done just fine. This girl was never bipolar. Mm -hmm. right? What was happening, what, it, what could have happened to her, is she could have ended up in this uh, place of being medicated the rest of her life. Why? Because the society and the, the notion of healing that this society is putting out there would refuse to actually listen to her own nature. Um, this is uh, from The Little Mermaid. And we know the idea of submerged sexuality in the story of The Little Mermaid that she's yearning to come, submerged sexuality of the young girl, yearning to come to the surface and yearning to come into contact with the masculine on the terrestrial plane. And here she is again. And what I'm trying to point out in showing this, uh, here's Jung. The inner image is a complex structure made of the most varied material from the most varied sources. It is no conglomerate, however, but a homogeneous product with a meaning of its own. So now our way to understand it isn't to prejudge it, but we have to meet it and have dialogic experience with it. The image is a condensed expression of the psychic situation as a whole, and not merely nor even predominantly of the unconscious contents, pure and simple. So it's not that all this arises from the unconscious. Some of this is right before us 
and has its roots right in her experience. But what's happening is that the image is a constellated phenomena that speaks to the immediacy of the experience and the moment in which we're um, coming together. It undoubtedly does express unconscious contents, but not the whole of them, only those that are momentarily constellated. Thank you. We're almost done. Ralph Waldo Emerson, uh, as, as many of you have probably experienced in your own readings, you know, keep bumping in to, to luminaries who have been articulating the problem that I think I hear you guys resonating with in this room. The problem of restoring to the world original eternal beauty is solved by the redemption of the soul. The ruin or the blank that we see when we look at nature is in our own eye. The axis of vision is not coincident with the axis of things. And so they appear not transparent, but opaque. The reason why the world lacks unity and lies broken and in heaps is because man is disunited with himself. What was called upon me in the interaction with this patient, and I'm talking about this as a kind of a paradigm, in a way, for understanding what is necessary for us, is to be able to open up new facets of myself of understanding what I don't understand and understand the logic and the sense that they make rather than sitting with my own perspective and judging the truth or falsity of what's there. And if you're not familiar with this book, uh, it's one of my favorite books, uh, Sayed Hussein Nasser, Man and Nature. It comes from a more Islamist perspective, but it speaks a world of truth. For a humanity turned towards outwardness by the very process of modernization, it is not easy to see that the blight wrought upon the environment is in reality an externalization of the destitution of the inner state of the soul of that humanity whose actions are responsible for the ecological crisis. I think that hits the nail on the head. Right? And the reason I've shown you this case is so you could see that in the immediate life of an individual, that matters. But I think that mattering also goes out into the rest of our lives and out into the environment. Our inability really to connect to ourselves um, actually has huge consequences. And with that, I will finish. <laughs> I, I imagine so. <laughs> uh, Robert. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much. I really appreciated your uh, uh, images and, and your discussion of your interaction with the, uh, with the